um, today's lesson has three main components. The last one's kind of like a little extra. But the, def the main thing today is to, to understand the definition and how to interpret two vocabulary words. Okay? The first vocabulary word that we're going to be learning about is this thing called correlation coefficient. So you'll see that first on your notes. We will learn what that is, how to interpret it, what that means, when you can use it, when you cannot use it. We'll also be talking about this thing called coefficient of determination. What that is, when you use it, what that means. And you see those two words are very similar. So we're really going to need to take the time today to make sure you learn how to keep these two things straight. I'm going to give you some information later to maybe another way to help you remember them to keep them straight. And finally, we're going to learn why the, the line of best fit is called the least squares regression line, which is frequently um, shortened to LSRF. Okay, so that's the three things that we want to cover today. First of which is this definition of our correlation coefficient. Okay, so this thing called correlation coefficient is represented by the little letter R. Now, I know if you're in physics, the little letter R is your resultant or something like that. Is that right? Okay. Well, not in stats, okay? So you guys going to have to keep your physics letters and your statistics letters straight. So this little R represents the linear correlation coefficient. Now, I know your result is kind of like your hotness, and this has to do with linearity. So maybe those do kind of coordinate somehow. So... Linear correlation coefficient. This being the key word. R is a measure of linearity. If it's not linear, don't use it to describe or interpret the relationship between the data. You get a measure of the strength. Is it weak, strong, moderately strong, very strong, perfect? linear relationship and the direction of it. Direction meaning like, what do you think? Positive, good, positive and negative. Okay. Now, in a sense, it is a measure of how clustered the data is around the line that is best fitting this data. And uh, again, represented by the lowercase r, here is the range of those values. It can go from a negative one to a positive one. So it's typically a decimal. We, we rarely, if ever, actually see a negative one and a positive one because a negative one and a positive one would both mean a perfect linear relationship. Okay? And in real data, how often is that going to happen? Not very often, if any. Um, what that would look like is this picture right here. An R value of 1 would mean that every actual piece of data is what was predicted. So do you see how every piece of data is on the prediction line perfectly? Okay. That's what the correlation coefficient of 1 would imply. Now, negative 1 is the exact same thing, just in the negative 1 direction. Okay, so these negatives and positives are the same string, just in a different direction. Now, if we have an R value that is 0, then that means that there is... And I'm going to sh actually show that down here. I'll go ahead and write it on the picture. When we have an uh, R value that is zero, that means that there is no linear relationship. Do you see how those dots are really very quite scattered around that line? And I could probably put that line anywhere, and it would look just as fine with any of those data. That data does not appear to have a linear relationship. Okay. 
And here's one thing that kind of gets a little tricky thing that gets missed sometimes when you see this. You have a linear relationship. However, it is possible that something like this could also have an R value of zero. Okay, ready? Here it is. What if you had data that looked like this and its R value was zero? Am I still saying that there is no linear relationship? There is no relate linear relationship. But could there be some other kind of relationship? Yes. This does appear to have some kind of quadratic relationship. So even though there is no linear relationship, there could be still another kind of relationship. Okay? So this R, again, is a measure of linearity. So it could be quadratic or exponential or logarithmic or any of the other functions that you've studied in your past math classes. Okay, so let's move on and kind of look at these different pictures when your R value changes. So here is a picture with an R value of 0.6. So do you see that these values are a little clustered closer around the line as opposed to up here when the R value is 0? And how about here when the R value is 0.9, these values are clustered even closer. So you compare those your R of 0.6 to your R of 0.9. See, those are clustered closer around the mean. Now, one other thing, point of confusion that I've had amongst my students is sometimes they think that the R value is related to the slope, and that is not the case. Do you see that the slope of all of these lines huh, is about the same? Okay, so I'm actually going to move that down so I can write better and not call it okay. So the slope of these lines is supposed to be, hopefully I put place them on there so that they're about the same. The slope is about the same. The slope is not what's making the correlation coefficient its value. It's how closely the points are spattered around and clustered around that line, whatever it is. Yes? that only the um, direction would coincide with the slope, 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 okay, that so would go together. Yes? So is this something more related to the monotone percentage, but if you're trying to solve the slope, there are still lines? Proximity? Yeah. Yes, I would say the proximity, and the reason I don't want to get your brain thinking about percent is because the next word that we learned today, coefficient of determination, relates to a percentage amount. And so therefore, I have to keep this different. So this would have to do with the proximity, the location of them around the line. Yes. But let's not go to percent. All right. So very good. This last part here is just another reiteration that the R value measures linearity. So it is appropriate in this case. It would be appropriate to interpret an R value for this. Okay. However, it would not be appropriate if somebody asked you to interpret the R value for this, then you would say, no, I'm not going to interpret the R value for this because this is not linear. And so therefore, that's not an appropriate um, way to represent the data. Okay. Now, when you describe the correlation, when you're using that to describe the relationship, and there's a phrase that I can guide you through that is helpful. You know, you can memorize it, but this makes sure that you include all the things that you need to include. So here are the things that you need to include. You would say that there is a, and then you would name the string. You would say words such as weak, fairly strong, moderately strong, strong, very strong. Okay, perfect, if it was one. So you would just tell the strength. We would tell the direction. That's the positive or the negative. Okay, you need to make sure that you include this linear, linearity relationship, linear relationship between, and then in context, you need to put your variables. Okay, so make sure that you are including 
your context on those variables. All right, and we're going to practice that here in just a second. But every year, I, I always have students ask me for a guideline to go by because they don't have a concept of what numbers mean weak, what numbers mean strong, what means, you know, is in the middle. So this is McClellan's very general guideline. Nobody ever told me this. This is what I kind of came up on based off of answer keys that I've come across. So this is a general guideline. It is not perfection. So here's kind of an idea. Of course, zero would be no linear relationship. Up to point three is probably a, a weak relationship. Okay. In the point four to point six, you're getting, you know, moderate to fairly strong. Um, point seven to point nine. Now I put strong to very strong here, but I really even hesitate to call point seven strong. I would be inclined to say point seven is somewhat strong. I don't think you can really classify strong until you start getting into the point eights and point nines. So I still would not necessarily even call point seven strong. And of course, one is a perfect linear relationship. All right, these apply to the negative values as well. So a negative 0.9 is a negative, very strong, and so on. Um, okay, all of that, however, there is a disclaimer, okay? I just put like a little asterisk here. There is a disclaimer, okay? So this, um, the guideline scale can change with the context. And you pretty much don't know that until somebody, until you get into the project. For example, if you were in a biology class and you were having to collect data and do some kind of analyzing of the data in the biology class, it could be that in the biology class, something like 0.9 or 0.91 is, is weak relationship in the data and you need to have something like 0.999 okay but you see that in that biology class you might be told by the professor or you know if you're working in the lab okay depending on how accurate you need to be you would need to get some kind of sense of what's considered strong in context of the problem I'm working with okay that's why no books I have seen actually give you this guideline because I think this is such a variable, this, this contextual value. Okay, so let's practice. Here we go. The following graph is a representation of data about the price of a pumpkin and its diameter in inches. Label and describe the graph. I should probably have said interpret the correlation coefficient. That's typically what, to what would be um, asked of you. So, of the price of the pumpkin and the diameter, what's going to be explanatory? Good. The diameter in inches, you need to get used to being more specific with your labels. Um, I did count off small amounts of points on your last quiz. Okay. Maybe I'll be able to show you that tomorrow um, on people who were less accurate on those. And then here on the side is going to be the price of the pumpkin. We probably need to have pumpkin in here somewhere so we know what we're talking about. All right. Very good. So now let's do the um, description of the correlation, what the correlation coefficient is saying. And here's what I would say. There is a, what would you say? Really somewhat strong. I usually leave moderate in the middles, like the 0.5s and the 0.6s. So there is a somewhat strong direction. Positive. Okay, what else? Linear. Do not leave that off. This is a measure of linearity. Linear relationship between the diameter and price of the pumpkin. Okay, very good. All right, so let's get the second one. This actually is a 
graph about the size of a grape farm. I boobied there on the writing. It's a grape farm and the price per pound that it charges its retail clients. So then, you know, it charges the stores, they buy it, and then they sell it on to you. So um, there is a problem. I, I did take a um, screenshot of this, this image from a site that I had online. There's a problem with that R value. What is wrong with it? Yes. It, it needs to be negative. That is clearly a negative relationship, not a positive relationship. So that was an incorrect um, graphical image. So what I want to do right now is uh, let you label your graphs and describe the correlation coefficient at this time. So take a minute to do that. Okay. Let's go ahead and check that. Um, here is your answer. So there is a weak. I chose weak. Okay, I probably would not say very weak. That would probably be reserved for your point ones or your point twos. But a weak negative linear relationship between the size of the grape farm and the price per pound sold to the retail client. Okay. All right. So that is the summary of all you need to know about this thing called correlation coefficient, about the linear correlation. So, our second vocabulary word that we're going to dive into today is this thing called coefficient of determination. Now, my students frequently get those two mixed up because they're kind of similar. They both have this word coefficient, which is just a representation of this number. So, I want to, before we go into the this, I want to talk about a way maybe that you could remember the difference between those two words and what they mean. So the first one was what? What was that first word? Correlation coefficient. Okay? So correlation coefficient. Alright. So the key to this is it was all about the what of the of the data, the relationship and the linearity of it. Okay, so it's all about. So this was all about the linear correlation. You said the strength, the direction, and the linear. So it's about the linear correlation. However, this thing about coefficient of determination. Here's a real. This, this thing that I'm about to tell you is technically not correct. It's a quick blip of how to remember it. We're going to be broaching this idea of the percent of y that is determined by x. Okay, that's not a completely correct statement, but it's a shortcut way to help you remember this determined. We're going to be getting into the percent of the response that is being attributed to the X. Okay, the percent of what's happening in the response is going to be determined by the X. So, before I even start that, I think a lot of these words here are just going to like ramble on and, and go in and out one ear. So, I'm going to first put it into a real world, real world situation to hopefully get you going on, on where we're headed with this. So, to start you off, I want you to consider the relationship between the price that a used car is sold for and its age in months. I know you guys don't have this written down actually, but I just thought this would be better to get you into this um, idea. So I don't want to talk about classics or specialty things. In general, what's going to be, of course, my explanatory variable here? Okay, good. The age of the car. And then what will be the response? Okay, good. So the price of that sold. Okay. So um, after we do that, then uh, in general, what would you say is the trend that would be happening? Just kind of. Okay, good. Probably it would be going down. Probably as your age increases, the price is going to be going down. Now there's going to be some outliers, you know, here and there and such, but in general, that's going to be happening. Okay, so 
I want to say, let's, I'm making this up. Let's just suppose that the coefficient of determination, which is this r squared, actually comes from squaring the r value, is 0.85. And here's what I would say. 85% of the changes or the variation in the price that it's sold at is explained by, okay, and it would be nice to put just straight up the word age there. It's technically not correct to say that, but I always think of that way in my brain. I always think age, but what we actually have to put instead of straight up age, we actually have to say it's explained by this linear relationship. It's explained basically by this line, okay? This linear relationship between the two variables. And they, they can be in any order here, age and price. Okay, let's think about that. So kind of 85% of the reason that the prices are different whenever you sell your car has to do with its age. Okay, 85% of the reason that the prices are changing has to do with the differences, the different ages that there are of the cars that are being sold, okay? What could the other 15% be attributed to? The type of car, how about the, um, gap, the mileage on the car, how much it's been driven, um, the features, the condition, okay? So 15% is happening because of something else. All right, so now let's go back here that we have that kind of contextual idea going on. So this coefficient determination is useful because it gives us the proportion or the percent of the fluctuation of the one variable, so like the response, that is predicted from the x variable. Okay? Um, it is a ratio of what was explained, the variation that happened, compared to the total variation. Now let's look at this. How about this right here? The values for your R squared is from 0 to 1. Why is it from 0 to 1? Because it's squared. What were the values, by the way, for the correlation coefficient? Good. Negative 1 to 1, but this one is R squared, and it's from 0 to 1. Okay, good. And again, why does it have to be from 0 to 1? Because it is squared, so the square makes it positive. There's another reason. It's a measure of percent. Tell me about percent. You can't have negative percent. Okay, good. All right, it represents the percent of data that is the closest to the line of best fit, which is kind of, I think, where you were headed, Sarah, so I wanted to stay away from that. So let's get to our phrase. Our phrase that we say when we are talking about this coefficient determination. And so it starts with, and we just did this a minute ago, we said 85% of the variation in, what was the response? The price was explained by that linear relationship between the age and price or whatever. I, I just switched those. So see, these can be switched. These two here do not matter the order you put them in, but how about this one? This one here has to be the response. This one has to be the y variable. I don't care the order on these two over here. Okay, so let's practice that. This second, this statement here kind of just has to do with what we just said. Also, 15% of the total variable is other things. Okay? So let's practice with our correlation coefficient example for the previous page. The first one was the problem about pumpkins, of which on Friday I won't be here because I get to go to the Main State Farm with my little kindergarten. Okay? So, yay. That'll be a good thing. I'll be gone for so, example one had to do with that, and it had an R value of 0.7. If it has an R value of 
what does the R squared value become? 0.49. It is the square of it. Okay. So, here comes our little sentence. And annoyingly, because you're not supposed to start a sentence with a number in English, you know, I would love to be able to go, here's the lazy way, 49%, blah, blah, blah. But I'm actually going to, especially since this is my recorded one, I'm going to start correctly. And go like this. I won't count off for you if you ever just use your number only. So there you go. So 49%, I'll use the symbol. 49% of the what on the pumpkin? The what? Not just price, but the fluctuation in the price. The variation in the price. The changes in the price. Can't just say the price. Okay. Forty-nine percent of the variation in price. I'm explaining the reason that the price is different. The variation in price is explained by what? That linear relationship between diameter and price by the linear relationship between diameter and price. Okay, very good. So this next one you get to do on your own. This one was the problem about the grapes. The size of the grape farm and the price per pound that you're selling the grapes. And the R value on that was negative 0.3. So therefore the R squared value is 0 0.09. So that actually is quite a bit of a small percent. That would mean that the other parts attribute there's 91% happening because of something else. So I'm going to take a minute, let you write that one yourself. Okay. on there. Let's see how you did on yours. Okay, here we go. Nine percent of the variation in the price per pound, so that's the response, okay, that the clients are paying, is explained by the linear relationship between the size of the grape farm and the price per pound. So did you get your things in the right place? All right. So again, the last two things that we have just done is make sure that we can know the difference between our correlation coefficient and our coefficient of determination. What those things mean, how they are written, the phrase, what those are describing. We have one last thing. We want to talk about why the least squares regression line is called the least squares regression line. Okay, so let's take a look at this picture. Here. Alright, so why is the line of best fit called the least squares regression line? So here we go. It has to, so what happens is when you put your data into your calculator, you put your data into your list, and then you press that little, you know, stat cap lin number eight, and then the calculator goes do, 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 to come up with where this line should go. Well, here's what that calculator is doing. It is figuring out how far the actual is away from the prediction line, and it is making the a square of that value to get an area. That way they're not canceling the values are not canceling each other out, because this would be below. I want to have positive values of these squares. So if you are in actual data and you are not right on the line, then you have a squared distance away from the data. Okay. So the line is located. So here we go. The least squares regression line is located where the sum of the squares, plural, 
and possessive areas is the smallest, or the sum is the smallest. In other words, the least, where the sum is the smallest. So, I want to show you a, an example of that. Here is a demonstration. I'm going to put some uh, points up here. And then we're going to look at, so here's some points. And see, and I have the ability to move this line around. And I'm going to try and move this line uh, to where I think it best fits the data. So what happens is I have these distances that the line, the actual are away from the line. And I'm going to square those so I get their areas and the areas don't cancel out. Because if I didn't do that, then these positive numbers up here would basically cancel out with the negative ones down here, giving me zero. So here comes the squares, and here comes the sum of the squares. See that right there? The sum of the squares, it says is 180. Watch this. I'm going to move the line, and it's going to change that sum of the squares. Okay, 180. Wow. There's no way I had it. Let's look over here. There's no way. I've never... Oh, see, look. It's getting better. So, 178... Okay, so 178 seems to be pretty good. Okay, so just because I want to show you what happens if you don't have it. So let's say I think it was 180, but I really know it could be as low as 178. When I press this button right here that says LS line, it's going to show me the real answer. That is the smallest sum of those areas. So here it goes. Aha, see, 178 was that value, so I did have it correct when I had it at 178. Okay, so that's how that line gets placed where it's supposed to go. It's finding out this squared distance, and it places it where the sum of those squares is the smallest, the least squares regression line. Okay, so I'm going to have you guys do a little contest between the boys and the girls. We're going to see which group can get their, their